Defying threats of legal action, publishers rushed to release Michael Wolff's explosive book about the Trump White House. This book is mistake after mistake after mistake. From Sean Spicer to other former White House officials, many raising questions over its credibility. We'll investigate. Plus, I'm asking for a special the time counsel. of the gentleman. And I would say expired. looks like is not enough basis to appoint a special counsel. Tensions between Attorney General Jeff Sessions and some House Republicans reaching a boiling point. Congressman Mark Meadows is here live to explain why he thinks it's time for the attorney general to go. And a follow up on a story you saw first here on Fox News at night. You had, you know, potentially dozens of criminal cases that that languished. We'll talk to a former DEA agent who was in the middle of those investigations and says the Obama administration undermined a critical task force that targeted Hezbollah as the president pursued a nuclear deal with Iran. Hello and welcome to Fox News at Night. I'm Shannon Bream in Washington. New tonight, Fox News confirming that the Justice Department has opened a new inquiry into the Clinton Foundation. FBI agents based in Little Rock, Arkansas, taking the lead. The Bureau focusing on whether the Clinton Foundation engaged in pay-to-play politics or other illegal activities while Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State. Fox News has also learned investigators are looking into whether the Clinton Foundation violated tax laws. Also new details tonight on special counsel Robert Mueller's inquiry into President Trump's firing of former FBI director James Comey. The New York Times reports that former chief of staff Reince Priebus kept handwritten notes about how President Trump called Comey to urge him to say publicly he was not under investigation. He also went to lengths to prevent Attorney General Jeff Sessions from recusing himself. We'll have much more with Congressman Mark Meadows, who is calling on Sessions to resign amid a growing number of leaks, like the ones that appears the New York Times has once again gotten. And more news tonight on the book, Fire and Fury, featuring explosive statements by President Trump's former chief strategist, Steve Bannon. In it, Bannon talking about running for president himself and much more. It appears to be just too much for many of his allies. Tonight, one king-sized GOP donor and influencer appears to be breaking with the one-time star of the anti-establishment GOP. White House correspondent Kevin Cork is working late into the night to bring us the very latest. Hi, Kevin. Always great to be with you, my friend. Now, yesterday, the president had this four-paragraph statement, and in it, he basically said that Steve Bannon uh, had lost his job and lost his mind when he was ushered off the White House team. Well, today, he had decidedly fewer words for his former chief strategist, who is frequently quoted in the book we've all been talking about. You see it right here, Fire and Fury Inside the Trump White House, which certainly has generated a storm of controversy because of a number of allegations, including a few real eye-openers, Shannon, from Bannon himself, including a suggestion that Bannon wanted to run or wants to run for president in 2020. I'm not kidding. Uh, well, today, for the very first time since the book controversy really erupted, the president finally responded on camera to comments attributed by his former chief strategist. I don't know, he called me a great man last night, so, you know, he obviously changed his tune pretty quick. Thank you. I don't talk to him. I don't talk to him. I don't talk to him. That's just a misnomer. Thank you. All right, so, all right, what gives? Well, why isn't the president talking to Bannon? Well, maybe because of some of the things he apparently has said in his book, like calling the president's daughter Ivanka, quote, dumb as a brick. He also apparently said that the president eats McDonald's food because he fears being poisoned. He also opined that there's a 33% chance that the president would either be impeached, resign, or limp to the end of his term. Now, for his part, Bannon also seemed to be downplaying the possible rift with the president, saying that, well, in a radio interview today, that he's still 100% behind the commander-in-chief. Don't worry, there will be no uh, daylight between the agenda, Donald Trump, and the uh, folks at Breitbart, and the, the show, and the website. The President, of the, United States, the President of the United States is a great man. You know I support him day in and day out, whether going through the country, given the Trump miracle speech, or on the show, or on the website. So I don't think you have to worry about that. Ah, uh, yes, but for all the olive branch extending by Bannon, well, he was actually hit today, Shannon, with a cease and desist letter. The president's lawyers accusing him of repeatedly violating the terms of his separation, including comments attributed to him in the now infamous book. And, and clearly, the patience of White House officials, my friend, well, after fielding so many questions about this book, well, it's getting pretty threadbare. 
I'm less concerned with my exhaustion as I am with the people of this country who frankly probably could care less about a book full of lies and would really like to hear more about the booming economy, the crushing of ISIS, all of the great things that are happening in this country or all of the big problems that we're focused on tackling. And the blowback continues even late this evening as tonight we have learned that Bannon's major benefactors, financial backers, are actually now beginning to back away from him. And that is a major deal. We can also tell you that the president tonight, Shannon, is finally tweeting about this one. This one actually just happening about uh, less than 10 minutes ago. He tweeted this, I authorized zero access to the White House, actually turned him down many times for author of Phony Book. I never spoke to him for the book. Full of lies, misrepresentations, and sources that don't exist. Look at this guy's past and watch what happens to him and sloppy Steve. That kind of night for Steve Bannon and even worse for the author. Although, if you're looking about book sales, well, they're expected to go on sale tomorrow. And given the controversy, Shannon, I think it's a pretty good bet he will sell more than just a few. Back I to you. I think you are right. Kevin Cork, again, great to have you with us tonight. Thank you. Anytime. As we mentioned at the top of the show, Fox News confirming the FBI office in Little Rock, Arkansas, is investigating the Clinton Foundation, possible pay to play on the radar. Joining us now, Fox News Politics editor Chris Steyerwall. Great to see you tonight, sir. Howdy, ma'am. What do you make of this? Because a lot of people think this stuff has all died out. Any talk of investigating the Clintons or of Hillary Clinton is just cover for what's going on with Trump, and it's not going to go anywhere. Well, both things can be true. <laughs> um, we have, uh, you would know this, Counselor, we have probably 98, 97 districts, uh, federal district courts in the United States. Each of them has a United States attorney. Uh, and the one in the Eastern District of Arkansas has been a hotbed of this kind of stuff for decades because where the Clintons have been and where the Clintons have gone, controversy and scandal has always followed. Uh, the U.S. attorney out there, I believe, is uh, named Cody Highland. Uh, I believe his name is. But he is a Mike Huckabee veteran. He was working for Mike Huckabee back in the days when the Clinton machine was trying to take Huckabee out as governor. Mm -hmm. uh, this is some old blood feud stuff, man. This yeah. is some deep down Arkansas Delta business. And what you see is this U.S. Attorney's Office, this FBI field office, has the opportunity. Whatever the Justice Department wants to do, obviously it has to be approved in Washington. But if this prosecutor out in Little Rock wants to take a good look at what the Clintons were doing and what was going on, I don't think there's probably much to stop it. Okay, so do you think it goes anywhere? Because we've been told before that this is just a rabbit trail, there's nothing to it, it's all been fully investigated, and there's no smoke, there's no fire. Well, if you love America, and I am told reliably that you do. As do you. Even though you beat me at trivia today. <laughs> we're not going to talk about uh, it, it's I'm, too I'm soon. I'm still, still smarting. Hashtag too uh, soon. Uh, but look, it is reasonable to want complete answers uh, about what's going on, what went on with the Trump campaign, and also complete answers about how the Clinton machine, the operation Clinton Inc., how it operated, what it did, what all was going on, were favors paid for. There was, we remember uh, Peter Schweitzer's book that, mm -hmm. that what we reported on too, the New York Times reported on and others reported on, that had a lot of stinky stuff in it. It seemed inappropriate. And if people were, or even thought they were paying for favors from the Secretary of State, when when she was in office, that's something we ought to want to know about, and we should be able to hold those two thoughts in our mind concurrently. Mm -hmm. All right, the Daily Beast is also reporting that the DOJ, they have information, is reopening a look into Hillary Clinton's emails. We've seen, and Judicial Watch reported today, I think that they um, they have pressed and pressed for information, that they've now uncovered there were more classified information, classified documents, emails on Anthony Weiner's laptop, that yeah. his wife, Huma Abedin, a close confidant of the Clintons, apparently that had gotten mixed up somewhere. Uh, so it sounds like there may be some interest in reopening whether or not she mishandled classified information. Maybe, but we've been down. Now this, if there's a rabbit trail here, this, this, has, more, this has more thicket around it than maybe the other one. This question's been explored. Obviously, people think that James Comey did it wrong. People think the FBI did it wrong. We've had, we have two or three investigations into the investigation of the investigation. Mm -hmm. uh, presumably, we will get to some clarity on this, but that will come as one unit, not some specific pull aside about Huma Abdin or something like that. Okay, now I want to talk about the, the Bannon quotes and, uh -huh. and the speculation within the Michael Wolf book. It's gotten really ugly between uh, Bannon and the president. They were once very, very tight, yep. uh, although the president seems to be downplaying that at this point. Um, <laughs> just you accurate. Can, you can do the, I'm going to classify that as a guffaw. <laughs> I think that as a guffaw. 
Uh, Michael Wolf, right. who is the author of this, he tweets, here we go, you can buy it and read it tomorrow. Thank you, Mr. President, saying, listen, you can threaten us with all these letters and lawsuits and everything else, but you're actually drawing more attention to it. But something we thought was interesting today uh, in the copy of, that we've gotten is that uh, Bannon apparently was telling people uh, in this book, it says, Bannon was telling people something else. He, Steve Bannon, was going to run for president in 2020. The, loc the locution, if I were president, was turning into when I am president. Because he talked about he thought the president was either going to get impeached, resign, or just barely make it through one term. As much as it pains me to spend any any other syllable of my life discussing Steve, Steve Bannon's theses about power and the application thereof, he was talking in that sense, if Trump didn't run or mm -hmm. wasn't running, he wasn't going to challenge Trump. The Bannon stuff here is basically a comeuppance for a guy who overstated, hyped his own game, with, by the way, the help of the press, who loved to make him into this Svengali who was behind Trump and controlling Trump and doing all these, because there had to be more to it. It couldn't just be red hats and rallies and MAGA, MAGA, MAGA. There needed to be some intellectual, and, and Bannon auditioned for that part and was granted it in large measure by the press, and now he goes kablooey. The stuff that's interesting in this book and the stuff that will last and is important in this book isn't about Steve. Bannon. What's interesting in this book is about how that White House allegedly worked in the opening months and what that means about John Kelly, what that means about going forward, what it means about the level of confidence that the staff has in the president and the president has in his staff. And I will say one thing. After all the allegations in this book, Donald Trump needs to give a real interview or hold a real press conference or do something soon to demonstrate to voters that the allegations in this book, that he is dotty or senile or incompetent, are untrue. He needs to get out and lay those to rest quickly or it'll stick. Well, there is always an open invitation for him to come a, and interview with us on Fox available. News at night. Uh, yes, it can happen, so <laughs> White House, call us, and we'll make that happen. Chris, good to see you. You bet. All right. Well, you may not have heard, but there's actually some good economic news happening on President Trump's watch on Wall and Main Streets. The Dow Jones Industrial Average hitting its seventh 1,000-point milestone since President Trump was elected, closing above 25,000 for the first time. This bull run began after President Obama was elected, but it's now accelerated quickly since President Trump took office. And a new report says private sector job creation surged last month. More companies today announcing they will give workers bonuses, pay raises, and increase 401 contributions to share savings from the $1.5 trillion GOP tax cut bill. President Trump weighing in on Twitter just moments ago saying this. The fake news media barely mentions the fact that the stock market just hit another new record and that business in the U.S. is booming. But the people know. Can you imagine if O was president and had these numbers, would be biggest story on earth, down now over 25,000. Well, four days into the new year, and there are new showdowns brewing in Washington. A big battle looming over immigration reform as Democrats continue to insist on a DACA deal before funding the government past January 19th. And today, the Trump administration opening up two new political battle fronts with plans to expand offshore drilling and to ramp up enforcement of federal marijuana laws. Doug McElway is following the storylines for us tonight. Hi, Doug. Good to see you, Shannon. You know, with its rapid pace of initiatives and controversies, the Trump administration is keeping all lawmakers on their toes while ensuring that Democrats and even a few Republicans are downright angry. First up, as you said, legislatively, is DACA. Mr. Trump invited a handful of Republicans, John Cornyn of Texas, Tom Cotton of Arkansas, and Lindsey Graham of South Carolina, to the White House today to help craft an immigration policy one that has these non-negotiable ingredients. Any legislation on DACA must secure the border with a wall. It must give our immigration officers the resources they need to stop illegal immigration and also to stop visa overstays. And crucially, the legislation must end chain migration. But many Democrats say they can't support such an immigration bill. Both the House and the Senate, though, will need some Democrat votes before they can get this thing across the finish line. Separately today, the Department of Interior announced plans to open up 90 percent of the U.S. Outer Continental Shelf to oil and gas leases. It's meeting with obvious Democratic resistance, but also most of the Florida congressional delegation, including Republicans and other Atlantic state lawmakers, are deeply opposed, fearing what could happen to tourism if an accident happens. Florida Republican Brian and Mass tweeted the plan is, quote, extremely alarming and unacceptable. Another hot button issue today, Attorney General Jeff Sessions rescinding Obama era marijuana enforcement guidelines. Session, Sessions is leaving it up to federal prosecutors in states that allow legal pot sales whether to crack down on the marijuana trade. 
Advocates who've witnessed the benefits of medical marijuana and states' rights conservatives are livid at this decision. Colorado Republican Senator Cory Gardner said Sessions promised him during his confirmation hearings he would not interfere with these state decisions. I believe what happened today was a trampling of Colorado's rights, its voters, and that's why I will be putting today a hold on every single nomination from the Department of Justice until Attorney General Jeff Sessions lives up to the commitment that he made to me in my confirmation, in my pre-confirmation meeting with him. Sessions is also catching flack from conservatives on a different issue. Republican Mark Meadows and Jim Jordan write that Sessions, quote, has no control at all over the premier law enforcement agency in the world and that the time for a new attorney general is now. Shannon, back to you. All right. Doug McElway, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Republicans will control House, uh, the House of Delegates in Virginia, and they've got the luck of the draw to thank for it. Literally, it all came down to a single contested state house race, which had flip-flopped back and forth after a recount and razor-thin margin. Well, a three-judge panel refused to hear Democrat candidate Shelley Simmons' argument over single contested ballots last month. So that left it in a tie. Well, the State Board of Elections met today to choose the winner based on a 1705 law. You see it there. They pulled a name out of a, a bowl. Republican incumbent David Yancey was declared the winner after his name was selected. Simmons says she is not ruling out seeking another recount in court. Well, we'll hear from Congressman uh, Mark Meadows in a moment on his call for the attorney general to resign. Plus, President Trump's fitness for office. According to Politico, lawmakers briefed by a psychiatrist who claims he's falling apart. Trace Gallagher brings us details on the diagnosis. And later, remember that bombshell Politico report alleging the Obama administration sabotaged the DEA's investigations into the terror group Hezbollah? Tonight, we have an exclusive interview with the former DEA special agent who was right in the middle of the controversy. He will be here live to separate fact from fiction. Republican Senator Cory Gardner blasting Attorney General Jeff Sessions today, threatening to block all of the president's nominees for the Justice Department. And it's all over the administration's decision to end an Obama-era policy called the Cole Memo, which allows state legalization of marijuana to thrive, despite a federal law that bans the substance. Senator Gardner, who once opposed the legalization of marijuana, has since supported the decision made by Colorado voters. And he now points to the economic benefits of legalizing marijuana. Listen to this clip from a segment about marijuana businesses in Seattle, Washington, facing the new reality of California legalization. 2018 brought the Golden State into line with other West Coast states for marijuana retail shops and products. That even playing field may expand the number of people who want to buy, but could undercut any attempt to make Seattle a special destination for pot tourism. Vela owner Aaron Green says it just takes a shift in the cell make a pot shop visit part of the Seattle experience, an add-on rather than the main attraction. A lot of their convention participants want a cannabis tour of some sort to be part of their Seattle visit. Hmm, well, now they have multiple state options, uh, but a diverse group of critics are worried about so-called marijuana normalization, just like you heard, uh, and they're praising Sessions for allowing the feds to enforce federal law, despite the states who decided to buck the feds and do their own thing. A former Obama administration drug policy advisor says DOJ's move will stop the massive infusion of money going to fund pot candies, cookies, ice creams, and other kid-friendly pot edibles. A mom who lost her daughter to a driver high on pot says that all too often marijuana is seen as benign. I hope those days are now over. And a former Democrat congressman says the Cole memo had been waved around by money-hungry pot executives for years, searching for legitimacy among investors and banks. It's time we put public health over profits. Today, Republicans seem divided on normalizing and legalizing marijuana, boiling down to states' rights versus doing what they believe to be the right thing. Joining us now, GOP Congressman Mark Meadows, Chairman of the House Freedom Caucus. We have many things to talk to you about tonight, but we'll sure. start here. Great to have you with us. It's great to be with you, Shannon. Uh, what do you make of this? Because I want to read a little bit more of a statement that we got from Senator Gardner's office as well. He says, reports that the Justice Department will rescind their current policy on legal marijuana enforcement are extremely alarming. 
In 2016, President Trump said marijuana legalization should be left up to the states, and I agree. What do you think? You know, here, here's what we have, have to, to really look at is, is a federal law. And, and this president has been consistent. He said, if there's a law in the books, let's make sure that we do it. Just like we're having to deal with DACA, mm -hmm. because we had President Obama overreaching on, on the DACA, the deferred action. He says, it's time for Congress uh, to act. And I think on this one, it really is for Congress to rescind the federal law, not an executive agency. And and, and Corey's a, a good friend. And I understand he's representing his state, but there, there comes a point where you allow states to affect federal policy instead of the other way around. And I think that that's troubling. So I support uh, Attorney General Sessions in this move. Uh, it, it really kicks it back to Congress, and, and now's the time for us to act if, if we want to, to address this particular issue. So you support the Attorney General on that, but I know yeah. there are some other criticisms, <laughs> criticisms that you have of him. Uh, your fellow House member, Jim Jordan, the two of you wrote a piece, um, and you say, listen, you're tired of the leaks that are happening, that there's been no evidence of collusion, and yet there are leaks all the time to places like New York Times. We have another piece out tonight where they, they cite multiple anonymous sources with all kinds of inside information from the Mueller investigation. They say it came from people who were either inside the White House or briefed on things that happened at the White House or the investigation. You say it's time for the leaks to stop. You say in this piece today, if Sessions can't address this issue immediately, then we have one final question needing an answer. When is it time for a new attorney general? Sadly, it seems the answer is now. He vowed it to crack down on these leaks and to hold people responsible. Well, but but no one's lost their job yet. And, and you know, the FBI and DOJ leak more than a 60-year-old wooden John boat. I mean, it, every single day we have more and more leaks that are coming out. And so it's critical, critically important that we address that. But not just that. Uh, the attorney general needs to do his job. You know, when he recused himself, where does his recusal start and stop? Uh, it, it, there's a, a, a big frustration on Capitol Hill that here we have investigated this Russian collusion for 16 months. There is no collusion. There is no evidence of collusion. And so yet here we, here we are in a situation where uh, we know that there are leaks are happening. We know that based on these reports uh, that they've used a dossier in an inappropriate manner, but yet we can't even get the very documents uh, to have proper oversight. Uh, so we're tired of the stonewalling. I talked to Chairman uh, Nunes this evening. Uh, he's going to get some documents uh, tomorrow. That's a good step in the right direction. But uh, we've seen this before. Uh, listen, I've been on oversight for over five years. What happens, they promise you that they're going to get it to you. They give it to you fully redacted, so a, a page of just blacked out lines. It is time that we get to the bottom of this. And it's time that we hold the FBI and DOJ accountable to the st standard that they should be held accountable to. Do you to. think, and we have talked about this, do you think that this is a quote unquote deep state problem? Do you think that there are people within the administration, maybe holdovers, others who are never Trumpers, uh, uh, opponents of the president, who are keeping you from getting the information that Congress is legally entitled to? Well, I mean, we, we don't have to look much further than the text messages between Peter Strzok and, and Lisa Page to, to obviously see uh, some type of bias. Now, whether that carries over into the investigation, we need to look at all the text messages. We need to, to, to fully look at that. But yes, I mean, in my conversations with others, are there people within the high ranks of DOJ and the FBI that uh, certainly... Uh, are, are not wanting to come forward with some of this information. I believe that that's the case. I'm not a conspiracy guy, but at the same time, give us the documents. We've requested some 15,000 pages of documents. It's time that we start to review them. With all these things in mind, the obstruction, the stonewalling, the leaks, are you calling on the attorney general to resign? I'm calling on him to do his job. And and if if he will do his job immediately and right away and quit making excuses. You know, you had in, a, in part of the lead up to this, you had attorney general Sessions saying, well, it's not time for a special prosecutor. Well, when we see the, the text messages and the emails that we've already visited, there seems to be some at least of, uh, appearance of impropriety. It's time that we actually get to the bottom of it. And so uh, he's got a very short fuse uh, from my standpoint, but uh, if he can do his job, uh, more power to him. We're, we would welcome the information to come forward. All right. Congressman Mark Meadows, always great to have you. Thanks Shannon, for coming great in. to be with you. All right. Some congressional lawmakers are questioning President Trump's mental health. We're going to tell you what one psychiatrist who came to Capitol Hill to brief them had to say. And we're going to tell you who met with her next. Plus, President Trump's tweets blamed for unrest in Iran. 
Well, Vice President Pence says Europe and the U.N. are not doing enough to help the people there. Stay tuned. Former U.N. Ambassador John Bolton joins us live. More than a dozen lawmakers, reportedly 11 Democrats and at least one Republican, met with Yale University professor Dr. Bandy Lee in closed-door briefings to discuss the president's mental fitness. Trace Gallagher has details on the diagnosis that lawmakers heard and what these secret doctor visits to Capitol Hill might mean for the presidency. Hey, Trace. <laughs> Hey, Shannon, when Dr. Bandy Lee finished up more than 16 hours of private meetings with those 12 lawmakers you mentioned, she apparently convinced some that it was time to invoke the 25th Amendment, saying the president was mentally unfit to fulfill the duties of the office, though she also indicated that getting Republicans to sign on would be a lot trickier. Dr. Lee acknowledges that it's unethical for a psychiatrist to diagnose from afar, but she believes it's her duty to warn the public about their leader's psychological instability, which is why she and 26 of her liberal colleagues wrote the book, The Dangerous Case of Donald Trump, where the president is compared to an American Hitler capable of staging a fake terrorist attack and showing signs of impulsivity, recklessness, and paranoia. Here's Dr. Lee on MSNBC. Watch. When silence uh, contributes to harm to the public health, then uh, we do have a duty to speak out. And the duty to warn and the duty to protect is pervasive in our practice. But not all mental health experts feel that same sense of duty. In fact, some say the dangerous case of Donald Trump is nothing but infatuous, tawdry, tabloid psychiatry. And Fox's Dr. Keith Abloh points out that when you acquire billions of dollars through complicated real estate transactions, then go on to become phenomenally successful in television and pull off an astonishing run for the White House, it is highly unlikely that you are not mentally unstable. Abloh says Dr. Bandy Lee is either a political opportunist or a fool, though he makes it clear he has not diagnosed her. Finally, it should be noted the stock market hates uncertainty and instability. Today, the Dow crossed 25,000. Shannon. So it did. Trace Gallagher, thank you very much. Joining me now, townhall.com columnist and radio host Derek Hunter and syndicated radio host Leslie Marshall, also a Fox News contributor. Uh, good evening to both of y'all. Good evening. Thanks for having me. Good evening. Okay, so assuming that we are all mentally healthy enough to have this debate, I want to talk about a little bit more about this. This is more, a little bit more of what that doctor had to say, Dr. Bandy Lee, who admits she has not met the president, anything like that. She says, we feel that the rush of tweeting is an indication of his falling apart under stress. Trump is going to get worse and will become uncontainable within the pressures of the presidency. Uh, Derek, it seems like he's been the same guy that we've seen and we've known, brash and, and bold and, um, you know, off the cuff. Uh, do you think he's changed? No, he hasn't changed. I've been following it. I've been a fan of The Apprentice since The Apprentice. It's it's a weird thing in Washington, D.C. that nobody ever speaks their mind. So when somebody does, it's considered a mental disorder. I got to give Dr. <laughs> Lee a lot of credit for her willingness to willingly and knowingly and admittedly violate the ethics of her profession in order to sell books. We'll see if it works out. But I, I think a book could be written about the violation of ethics for her profession in this case. Well, it's interesting that she came here to Capitol Hill and briefed people over a two-day period on this very real discussion about what would happen. Now, there's been this discussion, Leslie, you know, about the 25th Amendment, which provides a way for the vice president, majorities of the, uh, majorities of the cabinet members, uh, to step in if they think the president is unavailable, uh, unable, uh, incapacitated, can't get his duties done. Um, but to that discussion, Harvard Law Professor Alan Dershowitz, uh, who has not been a conservative in an, ever, uh, says this to Politico, the 25th Amendment would require for mental incapacity a major psychotic break. This is hope of reality. If we don't like someone's politics, we rail against him. We campaign against him. We don't use the psychiatric system against him. That's just dangerous. What do you think? Well, I actually do think it's dangerous to sound like you're making a diagnosis when you haven't actually seen a patient in any uh, area of medicine. Um, but I do think it's important for the American people uh, to be aware of what is going on with their leader. I think it's important for this or any leader uh, to have proper medical treatment. For Congress to be briefed by somebody who hasn't seen him, uh, to me, is, is not ethical. And quite frankly, even though I'm a Democrat, I've said it before, Shannon, you've heard me, uh, th this is not how, if... Uh, 
uh, the removal of Donald Trump ever happens, this is not how it's going to come about, because you don't have uh, the vice president, you don't have the cabinet, you don't have the Republicans uh, in, uh, in lockstep with the Democrats on this issue, even the one Republican uh, that sat down for this meeting. So I, I really just think this, quite frankly, is a waste of time, because this individual has not seen him. Having said that, though, he does have some tweets that are very similar <laughs> to North Korea, the North Korean leader, who many of us do think uh, is uh, quite the wingnut. So, uh, so, so I think he needs to stop some of that behavior, and then th maybe these conversations. Can we talk for Derek, a second about what Derek, is know, crazy? But, but we, we know he's not going to change his behavior. I no. mean, anybody who's followed him for uh, five minutes, five years, five decades, know this. He's not going to change his behavior. And, and he with won this, with that behavior, right? So. And and he feels like uh, by cutting through and using Twitter and that kind of thing, it, you know, that's why he won. Do you think even the left knowing that is highly improbable that any of this could happen, the 25th Amendment, et cetera, um, do you think it just makes them feel better to talk about it, Derek? This is for their base. This is, you've got members like Jamie Raskin and Zoe Lofgren. Jamie Raskin usually looks like he slept in a bag of potato chips. It, it, coming out and talking about how the president seems unhinged from afar through somebody who admits that they're violating the ethics of their profession. What really is crazy is advocating for policies that have failed the world over. Look at the UK. They've canceled in their national health system all non-emergency procedures through the end of the month because their system can't handle it. Yet there are many members who met with Dr. Lee who advocate to bring that sort of system here. I'd take 180 characters of crazy at a time over a nationwide policy over one-sixth of the U.S. economy any day of the week. Uh, Leslie, what do you make of, of Derek's uh, assessment that a lot of people just are not used to plain spoken, straight talking people in D.C.? It's true. Everybody here is the spin doctor. They very carefully craft their speeches. This president doesn't do that. Do you think it's such a shock to the system that people think, well, he's got to be crazy? No, but I do think that when an individual talks about the ability to start a nuclear war, which could kill not to millions start one, of people and, but, and, and but Americans he seems to be hinting by pressing at a button. One. It's also not a secret but that the president can you start don't, a nuclear you don't, there's war. There's nobody. If, if somebody if somebody says and threatens, if you will, on Twitter that my button's bigger than yours and I can press it and it's right here, that's dangerous talk when you're dealing with a very dangerous and unstable leader overseas like we have mm -hmm. in Kim Jong Un, and and that is the type of behavior I think that people on my side of the aisle question uh, the stability of with regard to the president. It's those specific types of tweets. All right, we got to leave it there, Derek and Leslie. In our sanity, we will close this debate. <laughs> Thank you both Thank very you, much. Shannon. All right, as the death toll rises in Iran, President Trump's tweets are being blamed for the unrest in the streets of Tehran and other, uh, other cities there. And North Korea testing more missiles. We'll tell you where and get the very latest reaction from former UN Ambassador John Bolton when we return. New tonight from the standoff on the Korean Peninsula, officials from North and South Korea will meet in neutral Panmunjom next Tuesday to discuss the possibility of North Korean athletes participating in next month's Winter Olympic Games outside Seoul, as South Korean President Moon Jae-in sees a groundbreaking chance to improve relations. We'll keep you updated on that. Iran's leaders now blaming President Trump and his Twitter habits for those deadly protests, and they aren't the only ones. Meanwhile, Vice President Pence penning a scathing piece slamming our European allies and the U.N. for failing to stand up for Iranian protesters. And U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations Nikki Haley a short while ago requesting a Security Council meeting on Iran. Former U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. and Fox News contributor John Bolton joins us live. Good to have you, Ambassador. Glad to be here. Okay, so let's talk about this meeting that Ambassador Haley's called for tomorrow. Dog and Pony Show, what happens? Well, I think it's important to continue the, the discussion about why the people of Iran are rising against the regime. I think that's uh, quite significant. I don't expect any substantive action out of the U.N. I think Russia and China would block any meaningful new sanctions. And honestly, I have to say that our friends in Europe haven't exactly stood up uh, uh, on this issue. So uh, the discussion will go ahead, but I, d I don't see anything coming out of it. Um, in a piece by the vice president today in Washington Post, he said this, the United States has spoken clearly and unequivocally. Unfortunately, many of our European partners, as well as the United Nations, have thus far failed to forcefully speak out on the growing crisis in Iran. It's time for them to stand up. Who are we calling out? 
Uh, well, I think uh, the European Union in particular, but uh, Germany, France, uh, and Great Britain, unfortunately, uh, partners in the uh, deal with Iran on the nuclear question. Uh, and it just shows that the Iranian strategy, the Obama strategy, worked. They sucked us and the Europeans into being able to trade and invest with Iran. Europe sees the possibility of profits, and they're blind to what's happening in the streets of Iran. So I didn't uh, write that article for Mike Pence, but I wish I had because <laughs> it's exactly the right point to make. Okay, what about Pakistan? We also got word today from the State Department that we're going to be freezing substantial security assistance that we give to that country. Not saying it's going away forever, but freezing it for now, uh, as there's a lot of tough talk about from this administration about the fact that they haven't been reliable partners in the fight against terrorism. Yeah, look, I, I remember George W. Bush very well after 9-11 when he said, with respect to terrorism, you're either with us or against us. And uh, people at the time said, oh, that's terrible. You shouldn't uh, hold nations to account. I think it was the right thing to say then. And I think uh, President Trump is really going back to that. So freezing uh, this assistance, I think, is an incredibly important signal to Pakistan. The one thing we've got to remember is that in this unstable political environment, civilian government not uh, being all that strong, the military in Pakistan increasingly infiltrated by radicals, that they are a nuclear weapon state. So if you push them all the way over to the other side, you risk having those nuclear weapons being dispersed to terrorists who could take them anywhere in the world. That's something we've got to focus on as well. But leaning on Pakistan, it's about time. And looking back to the last administration, we're getting word tonight, confirmation that there is an investigation looking into the Clinton Foundation, whether there was pay to play there, whether there were favors that were done for countries and um, in any connection with Bill or Hillary Clinton in, in benefiting the foundation anyway. Your reaction? Look, I think these questions need to be answered. And, and I'm very disturbed as a Justice Department alumnus myself of the politicization of law enforcement, the politicization of intelligence. Uh, of uh, investigations being cut off that uh, should have been allowed to go forward. Uh, I, I believe this investigation, which is being conducted by the U.S. Attorney's Office for Arkansas, is exactly the right way to do it. You don't need a special counsel to do it. This is, I trust, the career prosecutors, and I think we ought to let it go ahead. There's, there's so many uh, things about the foundation that uh, look like Tammany Hall, as Walter Russell Meade once compared it to. So let's see what it looks like. We will see. All right, Ambassador, great to have you with us. Glad to be with you. Thanks for coming on. All right, a massive snowstorm pummeling the East Coast from blizzard conditions and bitter winds to coastal flooding in some parts. A bomb cyclone update coming your way. But first, an exclusive interview with a former senior DEA official at the heart of Politico's bombshell report that the Obama administration derailed investigations into the terror group Hezbollah's drug operations. He's next. A bombshell report by Politico alleging the Obama administration interfered with a federal investigation into how Iran-backed terror group Hezbollah turned profits on illegal drugs and weapons trafficking. According to the report, the previous administration didn't want anything to get in the way of a nuclear deal with Tehran. Now, you'll remember, we spoke with the investigative reporter who broke the story. Federal investigators were watching and gathering evidence of Hezbollah sort of transforming itself from a from a political power and a terrorist organization to one that was trafficking in drugs. And they do documented was that they were doing it to raise money uh, to help rebuild after the Israel war and to help an expansion that they were doing globally. So they gathered evidence. They designated about a couple of dozen super facilitators as people that were connected to the conspiracy. But when they really tried to delve deeply into these people, they got shut down. Tonight, we are bringing you an exclusive interview with Derek Maltz. He's the former special agent in charge of the DEA Special Operations Division, quoted extensively in that Politico report. Um, great to have you with us tonight. Thank you, Shannon. I want to read a little bit of what you said there. You said, there's no doubt in my mind now that the focus was this Iran deal, and our initiative was kind of like a fly in the soup. We were the train that went off the tracks. At what point did you realize all this intel you had gathered about the millions that Hezbollah was laundering, even through this country and making around the globe, wasn't going to be prosecuted? Well, I found it very, very odd that in our backyards all over America, they were sending used cars back into West Africa to sell. And the profits of these used cars and all this drug trafficking money was going back to support Hezbollah at the tune of $200 million a month in businesses throughout our country. So I found it kind of odd that we didn't have a, a unity of effort to actually shut it down. I found it odd that we didn't have leadership in the administration that would, it would actually enforce and hold people accountable to bring the agencies together to ensure that we can protect the American public. Mm -hmm. 
It was it, very strange. You were in a meeting, uh, at least one meeting that I know of, with Attorney General Eric Holder, who seemed to be interested in this. You, you were told there would be a follow-up, that they would be getting back to you. What happened? Well, Eric Holder was very supportive of the Special mm -hmm. Operations Division. I was very fortunate to be in charge of that for almost 10 years, and almost every operation he actually approved and was supportive. Well, in this particular case, we briefed Eric Holder. He was very alarmed by the findings of this particular investigation and the magnitude of money and drugs that were moving around the world. So Eric Holder was pretty you know, serious about having follow-up meetings with national security team members, and the, the briefing never happened. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was very strange for me sitting there listening to the Attorney General of the United States directing his people to have a meeting to get more information from the DEA and our interagency partners about this global trade-based money laundering scheme, and they weren't interested. It never happened. And I can't explain it. In the meantime, the administration was also working on a deal with Iran over its nukes. Um, there is a, you know, Josh Meyer, who did the political piece, talked to you and others, and came to this idea that it's possible that's what this was all about. They didn't want to go heavy on Hezbollah because they wanted to get that nuke deal done. Is that your impression? Well, look, I don't have any information on what was going on behind the scenes on the Iran nuke deal. Honestly, from my perspective, if you have this magnitude of money and drugs moving through our country and the banks in our country, that should have been something that our government enforced full accountability on all the agencies to work together and shut it down. But it didn't happen. It didn't happen. We had some significant successes. We had tremendous uh, you know, uh, response from the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Southern District of New York. We did a $480 million civil seizure uh, on the bank and 30 businesses. But you know what's sad, Shannon? We put 30 businesses in this action, but there were actually hundreds of businesses mm -hmm. that are still operating today. Today? And today. In this country, there are cars moving going to West Africa. The car parks are lined up and they're booming. If you look at the Wall Street Journal article at the end of 2016, they talked about how these car parks are exploding, not just in Benin, but all over West Africa. And they're coming from our backyards right here in our mm -hmm. country. And you're saying this is how the money is being laundered? The money is being Hezbollah. laundered. It's supporting Hezbollah. They're buying weapons. They're coming up with their logistics. You see, you know, criminals are turning, uh, uh, terrorists are turning to criminal mm -hmm. networks for their funding. State sponsorship is down. They need funding to mm -hmm. operate. They need funding to corrupt government officials. Drug trafficking, other criminal activity around the world is That's helping to generate hundreds of millions of dollars. The UN estimated that drug trafficking a few years ago was generating $400 billion a year around the world. The terrorists are taking advantage of this opportunity. Financially. They're, financially, mm -hmm. yes. They need the money to operate. I want to let you reply to a couple of Obama administration officials who have had um, shot down when you said, first of all, Marie Harper used to be with the State Department. We'll play her. You know, the Politico story, this narrative in it, is just false. And there's no evidence in the story to back up their allegations. They quote a couple of low-level ideological sources who clearly don't like the Iran deal. Low-level ideological low sources. Low-level sources. I was the head of the Special Operations Division for over 10 years, 30 different agencies, three countries, the NYPD, to protect this country. That lady didn't work on the operation. She worked as a bureaucrat in Washington talking about you know, policy and stuff, but she wasn't involved day to day in the operation. She didn't see what we saw every day on the streets of America and in Europe, in West Africa. And so I, I have a problem with her. You're referring to the low level sources. The folks that spoke about the story actually were intricately involved in every aspect of this case. And as a matter of fact, David Asher was the expert uh, in the first 311 action against North Korea. And he was the one that helped us put together mm -hmm. the Patriot Act 311 action in this case to shut down this international trade-based money laundering scheme. We thank you staying here to break some fact from fiction for us and for all of your work for this country as well. Derek, thank you so much for coming in. Thank you very much. The only last thing I would like to say to the viewers is, is that this particular photo right here from Admiral Jim Stavridis with a fireball mm -hmm. is why we were trying to shut this scheme down. And we'll tweet it out so people know what it is. Thank you, Shannon. More news next. Most watched, most trusted, most grateful you spent the evening with us. Good night from Washington.